Hello and welcome to this video. The value of our engineering simulations, as well as the safety and reliability of the engineering products we develop, are all dependent on the accuracy of our analysis results, and this holds equally true for transient simulations. When we talk about numerical accuracy, we might think of considerations such as the mesh density and the time step size. The precision of the solution can be improved by defining smaller and smaller mesh size and time steps but this comes at the cost of computational time. Additionally, how many modes are included in the transient solution is important. We cannot capture a higher frequency transient response if we do not include higher frequencies in the modal solution. As a result, we'll have to strike a balance between numerical precision and computing expense. The addition of residual vectors can also help achieve more accurate results with fewer higher modes. In this video, we will discuss these topics in an effort to achieve an accurate transient response. We begin with a brief lecture, and then we move on to a workshop demonstration of a pre-stressed drum head. Ready? Let's get started. Mode superposition transient is a computationally efficient solution method, but in order to obtain accurate results, we should be aware of four key considerations as just mentioned. Let's explore them in a bit more detail. First, let's start with mesh density. If the mesh is too coarse, it cannot accurately capture the mode shape and hence the natural frequency. For example, we have this square plate and showing one of the more complex mode shapes. Now notice as we increase the mesh density, we can properly resolve the mode shape and the frequency converges. With the coarse mesh density, the frequency and shape are incorrect. When we have a sufficiently fine mesh density, there is no further change in shape and frequency. Our second key consideration is the extraction of sufficient number of modes. The mode superposition method relies on the combination of modes to capture the response. Too few modes and we cannot accurately capture it. When this happens, we refer to it as mode truncation error. Let's use a cantilever beam for a quick illustration of this concept. Now imagine I extract just a single mode of the torsion mode shape from the modal analysis that looks like this. We can see the beam is twisting. Now, if I run a transient solution with a quick force at the tip, like someone striking it, I would expect the beam to respond like this. But since we have only one mode and that shape does not represent the bending shape of the beam, we end up with an incorrect transient response to the beam. Notice it does not deflect in the vertical direction at the free end, even when hit by a vertical force. Instead, we get close to a numerically zero response. Keep in mind also that a faster impulse force may excite higher modes compared to a very slowly applied force. So the number of modes to include can also depend on the rate of loading. It's better to have more modes than fewer, but of course this comes at a computational cost. If uncertain, add more modes to the analysis settings of the modal solution and compare the transient response for your specific loading. Our third key consideration is the time step size should be sufficiently small. This is for two principal reasons. A large time step size will not be sufficiently small to resolve the higher frequencies in the response. While this may seem obvious, have a look at the time history of a transient response with different time step sizes. When two course of time step size is specified, the peak responses can be missed and the higher order frequencies in the vibration won't be resolved. Typically, the indication that the time step is too coarse is the faceted or unsmooth nature of the response. Now, in a physical system that has no nonlinearities, we would not expect to see a faceted time history response. But this can also happen in experimental testing if the sample rate of the testing instrumentation, such as an accelerometer or a strain gauge, is set to too few points per second. Additionally, in the audio world, this is somewhat similar to the sample rate of the audio signal when an analog signal of say a song is converted to a digital signal. The key point here is the time step size should be based on the modes of interest. One simple rule that can be used is to take the highest mode of interest, invert it to find the period, and divide that number by 10. This will assure you can resolve the time history response of the highest mode of interest. For example, if the highest mode of interest is 5000 Hz, then the time step size to specify 
would be one tenth times one over 5,000 hertz, and that comes out to 2e to the minus five seconds. Now, another consideration as to why the time step size needs to be sufficiently small is that any tabular loading that is applied will only be properly applied if the time step size is small enough to resolve the loading time history. In other words, let's say a transient pulse is applied over 0.005 seconds, but the time step is 0.01 seconds. Then the load is effectively passed over. So take care to specify a sufficiently small time step to avoid this. Now, if the time step is much, much smaller than the smallest period or the highest frequency, having such smaller time steps adds nothing to accuracy, but just adds a lot of terms of storage because we store the results at each time step by default. And if you're wondering, this can be changed under analysis settings, output controls. Now, the fourth and final consideration is the option to include residual vectors. Now, residual vectors are additional modes or pseudo modes that can be added to the solution and can reduce the total number of modes necessary to capture the response. They are most effective when the loading creates a localized deformation that would require many higher modes to resolve. Now, an example of such loading might be a concentrated load on the region of the part that causes localized deformation. In this case, residual vectors can be turned on and fewer number of modes need to be specified. To learn more about residual vectors, please see our video titled Utilizing Residual Vector Methods in ANSYS Mechanical. Let's now get into our workshop model. For this workshop, we will analyze the response of a pre-stressed drum head. A drum is constructed of the cylindrical body, the drum head, which is the acoustic surface, the rim to tension the drum head over the body, and the tensioning rods and hardware. The tensioning rods connect to the rim are used to tune the drum head by varying their tension. By tightening the rods, the rim is pulled downward and the drum head is stretched over the drum body. The drum head is represented as a shell body in ANSYS Mechanical and it will be struck by a drumstick. Now the drumstick is not modeled, but we will specify the impulse loading acting on two small patches of the drum head where the drumsticks hit. To account for the tension in the drum head, we do not need to include the body, the rim, nor the tensioning rods, but instead we'll apply the appropriate boundary conditions to represent their presence and behavior. We first carry out a base static analysis or stress analysis to compute the stress stiffening matrix. Then we proceed to compute the modal solution and finally the transient response we're interested in. So let's begin by opening the archive project drumhead in ANSYS Workbench. A static structural system with engineering data and geometry has been defined. Double click on the model cell to open ANSYS Mechanical. Change the units to millimeter, kilogram, newton, second. Click on the geometry branch and go to the mid surface for the drum head. Specify a uniform thickness of 0.2 millimeters for the drum head. We see the material assignment of the drum head is that material, which is PET, a thermoplastic polymer resin. To generate the mesh, right click on mesh in the tree outline and pick generate mesh. We'll use a mesh that's default element size for this example. Click on the static structural branch. Select the inner edge of the drum head, which rests on the cylindrical rim of the body. Right mouse click and insert displacement. Set the Y component to zero while keeping the X and Z components free. This mimics the cylindrical lip of the drum body, which the drum head will slide upon. To tension the drum head, insert displacement. Scope it to the outer edge and specify a displacement of minus 0.5 millimeters in the Y direction and zero in the X and Z directions. This is akin to the physical tensioning via the rim pulling the edge of the drum head downward, putting the drum head into a state of tension. To account for the localized large deformation and rotation the drum head sees when pulled down over the lip of the drum head, large deflection should be turned on to properly account for this effect. Let's solve the model. Right click on solution and insert total deformation. Evaluate all results. Play the result animation. 
we can see how tension acts on the drum head following its tuning. In the Home tab, pick Analysis, then Modal. Click on Pre-Stress, then choose Static Structural. Supports are not needed to be added in the modal solution since they are already defined in the static analysis. Let's set the number of modes defined to 30. Solve the model. Left click on the tabular data as shown. Right click and pick Create Mode Shape Results. Right click and evaluate all results. Click on the first mode and animate the results to see the mode shape. Notice the mode shape is exaggerated. Feel free to repeat this for other modes to get a sense of the natural frequencies and mode shapes. Now let's set up the mode superposition transient. Pick Transient Structural System in the Home tab. In Initial Conditions, pick Modal. This tells Mechanical that the modal solution results will be used in the transient analysis. To get accurate results using the mode superposition method, the recommended ratio of effective mass to total mass in the modal solution should typically be greater than or equal to 0.9. To find that, let's go to the solution information of modal and there check the participation factor calculation in the y direction, in the direction of impact. Despite including 30 modes in the modal solution, the ratio of effective mass to total mass in the y direction is approximately 0.8. Now, the use of residual vectors helps to reduce the number of modes needed to get accurate results for this type of concentrated loading of the drumstick, striking a small region of the part. To include residual vectors, go to Analysis Settings, and in Details, set Include Residual Vectors to Yes. Turning this option on produces a warning message, but that's only because no loads have been defined yet. When the excitation force is defined, this warning message will disappear. Let the number of steps be 1, and set the step end time to 0.05 seconds, which is long enough for this example to capture the initial transit response of the drum head after the impact. The time step size should be small enough to accurately capture the transit response of the structure. Typically, the time step size for mode superposition transient is calculated as 1 tenth times the period of the highest frequency of interest as discussed prior. So if we could excite that frequency in a time history, we would have 10 results points per period at that highest frequency, and hence a trace of the response time history would be smooth. Let's go to the modal solution and have a look at the highest mode shape which we are considering, which is the 30th mode. We can see that the frequency for this mode shape is around 390 Hertz. Using the 1 tenth rule, the time step size is computed as 1 tenth times 1 over 390 hertz, which equals approximately 2.5 e to the minus 4 seconds. Now, under damping controls, specify a damping ratio as 1%, and we use this just for demonstration purposes. Let's now apply the excitation, which is the force with which the drummer strikes the drum head with a drumstick. Note that for this example, we consider the drummer strikes the drum head twice at two different positions with a slight time difference between the two strikes. Right mouse click on transient and insert force. Scope it to one of the two striking faces. Change the defined by components. Change it to the Y direction to tabular data. In tabular data, in the Y direction, set zero newtons for the time of 1 e to the minus 3, minus 1 newton at the time of 3 e to the minus 3, and again 0 newton at the time of 5 e to the minus 3. This triangular pulse represents the impulse load acting on the drum head. Similarly, for the second strike, insert force and scope it to the other striking face. Again, change defined by the components, change the y direction to tabular data. Since this force acts after the first impact in the tabular data in the y direction, set 0 newtons at a time of 2.7 e to the minus 2, 1 newton at 2.9 e to the minus 2, and again 0 newton at 3.1 e to the minus 2. Let's look at the relative timing of two impulse excitations. 
Both of them act for the same period, but have a slight difference in their striking time. Let's now solve the model. Insert directional deformation result and set the orientation to the y-axis. Insert two directional deformation results and scope them to each of the striking positions and orient them in the y-axis. Let's evaluate all results. Looking at the directional deformation results scoped to the entire body and animating the results, we can see a fairly complex transient response from the two drumsticks striking as their response interact with one another. Looking at the response as the first striking position and animating the results, we can see the time history response for that specific location. We can also repeat this for the second striking position. I hope this video has demonstrated the importance and the methods of obtaining an accurate transient response. We covered several factors that can affect the mode superposition transient response's accuracy. Simulation results in general, taken at face value without knowledge of the influences of the settings, can lead to inaccurate results and with transient response, that is no different. Thank you for watching and do check out our other courses to discover more useful learning resources.